Hi, everyone. Welcome to your podcast, New Books in Economic and Business History. I'm your host, Javier Mejia from Stanford University. And today I have the great pleasure to be with Martin Prack and Jan Luten van Sanden. Martin is professor of social and economic history at Utrecht University, and Jan Luten is professor also at Utrecht of global economic history. They are the authors of this book, Pioneers of Capitalism, the Netherlands from the year 1000 to the year 1800. I'm very happy to be with them. How are you, Martin, Jan Luten? Yeah, it's Excellent. snowing, Thank you. Uh, but otherwise, um, um, yeah. everything's fine at this end. Yeah, here as well. Thank you. We live no, in the glad. same neighborhood. Really? Oh, that's interesting. I actually want to ask you about that. And, and if you don't mind, we can start with that. You have, um, um, let's say, a very sweet uh, comment in the acknowledgement of, of the book where, where you describe that you started your careers at the same time, right, uh, a few decades ago. And so in a certain sense, you've had like parallel interests. And again, like the path of your career has been connected for, for quite a while. Um, would you mind if you tell me a bit about how that pad has uh, been constructed? How did you end up being the type of scholars that you are interested in the economic history of, well, the Netherlands, but uh, of many other parts of the world? Would you mind to start with that, uh, Martin? And then I would want to hear what you-, you Maybe yeah, you'll like to we'll start uh, with this question and I'll fill in some of the details or correct him. Okay, well, let's, let, let me uh, say a few words about my own career. I started studying development economics in the 70s. I wanted to change the world and solve the problem of poverty. That was the main driver of my choice of the study. And then I read the book by Wallerstein and I became fascinated by the historical uh, dimension of poverty in the world economy and I, I decided to take on history as well as a, a second study and uh, well in a way th as a result I became an economic historian uh, I became very fascinated by long-term trends in the, the world economy and their explanation and uh, in 93 Martin and I decided to uh, join forces in a way and become uh, both professors in economic and social history at Utrecht University. So uh, uh, since uh, we have shared a chair more or less in uh, economic and social history and have built up a, a, a nice research group and we have uh, actually also become emeritus professor. We have uh, in the Netherlands, you are supposed to retire at a certain point. So at this point in, in June uh, last year, we had an official party uh, celebrating our retirement. And now we have officially stepped down and we are still working on many projects, but officially we are not a professor at Utrecht University anymore. So maybe I'll add uh, that we've collaborated for 30 years. When we applied for the job together, we promised we would write a history of capitalism in uh, the Netherlands. And just before the retirement that Jan Luyten mentioned, we uh, thought it would be a good idea to deliver on that promise before <laughs> people would... Uh, take our pensions away because we didn't do what we had set out to do at the beginning. But the book is the fruit of three decades of uh, thinking, uh, talking, not only between ourselves, but also with the wider group uh, of economic and social historians in uh, Utrecht about, well, as Jan Luyten already said, improving the state of the world. Why is it that some societies prosper and others don't? And in a way, that's also 
the theme of the book because we um, want to, well, we discuss in the book why, why some elements of Dutch capitalism worked well and others probably did not. Well, we'll talk about that, I suppose, in the next uh, 45 minutes, but that's what is behind the book. So not merely an intellectual interest, but also, well, if you will, a political interest. I, I want to ask you more about your, <clears throat> I guess, your perception of the discipline in this 30 years, right? So you've seen um, many things happening in the field. And I guess here I'm interested both in economic history in general, but also, mm -hmm. I guess, in the interest on the economic history of the Netherlands in particular, mm -hmm. where things have changed since you... Uh, we're appointed uh, jointly in, at, at Utrecht for the first yeah. time. How? What's your perception about the, the field in general? Yeah, well, uh, there have been many positive changes, I would say. One is that the field of economic history has been broadened uh, enormously. 30, 40 years ago, it was about economic growth. It was about measuring real wages and things like that, which are still important. But we, we fire the institutional angle on things. We now study uh, parliaments and uh, democracy and religion and uh, uh, all kinds of uh, institutions, marriage systems. So it has become much more inclusive in a way in terms of the topics that we think are relevant for explaining long-term social and economic development. And that's a very good thing. It has made our stories also much more interesting in many ways, I, I think. And the, the other big change has been the, the development, the rise of quantitative studies. Uh, and I also think I'm, I'm clearly a representative of that, that the change uh, that it has also improved and uh, uh, clarified many discussions uh, uh, about the world economy in the last thousand years or so. Or so. so I'm also very opt uh, optimistic about the changes that we have introduced in the field. Right. When I was, was clearing my bookshelves, at least one of the bookshelves, because it's quite a problem to clear all your bookshelves at the moment, I found a book uh, that I studied in the 70s as the first textbook in economic history, Tuma, uh, uh, now uh, very, uh, almost uh, unknown. And I was really surprised by the progress that we have made since the 70s in quantifying and understanding uh, uh, long-term economic change in the world economy. So I should perhaps explain that I am not an economic historian in the strict sense of the word. I'm more of a social historian. And I don't think you can make quite the same claims for social history. But for me, too, I was always interested in uh, the political side of social history. This uh, institutional turn in economic his history has made it possible for the two of us to collaborate much more closely because I... Uh, was working on the social side of institutions. Uh, Jan Luyter was interested in the uh, economic side of institutions. And the combination, well, we like to think has worked really well. But if you look at social history as a separate field, there has not been quite the same kind of uh, progress that Jan Luyter was talking about. And one of the reasons is that partly because of the cultural turn in social history, there has not been uh, a theoretical framework uh, as is offered by economics for the social history that is embraced by most practitioners of social history. So social history is a much more, um, well, diverse field, if you want to say it in a positive way, but you could also say that it is much more scattered uh, and that social historians find it difficult to um, work on the same projects. 
So what that's about? Why I liked collaborating with economic historians. Right, and what about the interests and in both of these fields uh, for the Netherlands? Has it increased in this last? Um, 30 years, uh, are we still, uh, equally, um, uninterested on the, on the Netherlands? Is it the, the other way around? I have the general impression, to be honest, after reading your, your book that everyone should know more about the Netherlands, right? It's like such a crucial episode mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and economic and well, social history. Yeah. Well, that uh, everyone should have like, a very good understanding of what uh, has happened in the Netherlands. But um, has that interest increased or even like what was the, the, the landscape of, of interest yeah. uh, 30 years ago? So maybe I can kick off this one. Um, okay. I, it's very difficult to say if the interest uh, in the Netherlands has changed a lot, but I do think that we as Dutch historians have been quite successful in making the claim that Dutch history matters for an international audience. And one of the reasons is, uh, and this is not specific to social and economic history, but more to uh, the Dutch um, academic landscape more generally, that it has become very international. So in the Netherlands, most scholars publish in English in particular. And actually, there's a big debate going on in this country uh, about the number of uh, academic courses offered in English. Uh, and uh, some people are saying there, should, there are too many. There are too many foreign students. There are too many courses in English. So in our department, you can do an undergraduate degree in history, both in English and in Dutch. Uh, and this is a quite normal situation in the Netherlands. So people publish a lot in English and have been, uh, the two of us have been really involved in that, in thinking very hard about the Dutch, uh, about Dutch history in a sort of global perspective. Uh, and that's why, um, yeah, you will find much more information about Dutch history than, for example, about Polish history in English uh, with international publishers. Yeah, I, I agree, of course. The, the number of people working in the field internationally on, on, on Dutch economic and social history has increased uh, enormously. When I started doing research, there were two economic historians working on in the international arena on, on Dutch economic history. And that were both were Americans, Joe Mokier and John de Vries. And, uh, and Dutch scholars did not participate a lot in international debate. And that has changed enormously. So there are now uh, 20, 30 colleagues who are working and publishing internationally on the kind of topics of economic and social history. So, but of course, this has been happening on a global scale. Uh, people working on China have increased even more dramatically. So perhaps we have been overshadowed by growth in other countries, but the total output is much higher than it, it was uh, 30 years ago. That's very interesting. It's also very interesting to hear that uh, then there's also a sort of pushback from like nationalist forces, uh, apparently. Um, yeah. so, I mean, I'm a true globalist, so I hope that that uh, doesn't uh, expand. But let, let, let me get in, into the book because um, I, I find it truly fascinating. And one of the interesting things about the book is that it's a very uh, like long durée history of of the Netherlands, right? So you start in the Middle Ages um, and you do a very interesting um, analysis of how the Middle Ages were in the Netherlands and, and the particularities that it had. Um, tell us a bit about that. What type of place was the Netherlands during the Middle Ages? How similar it was to some of the most iconic um, episodes, right? People usually think about 
feudalism in France or England, how different was the Netherlands during this period? And I don't know if maybe Martin, you would like to start with this? Um, uh, well, let me say a few words and then I'll hand over to Jan Luyten, who has written the medieval chapters. Um, so first thing to keep in mind, the Netherlands as a country did not exist in the Middle Ages. Eh? There was nothing like it. It was um, very sparsely populated and particularly the western part of the Netherlands that we now know as Holland were basically a, a big swamp with uh, um, some a barrier of uh, sand dunes separating it from the North Sea. Um, but it was very sparsely inhabited and only during uh, after the year 1000 did people move into the area and start to uh, drain some of the, those parts uh, and create yeah, basically man-made uh, land um, where gradually, of course, villages and towns uh, emerged. And maybe there Jan Luyten can uh, take over. Yeah, and uh, the Netherlands was clearly on, on the margin, in a way, of the European feudal system. The hard uh, land of the feudal system was in the southern Netherlands, in northern France, in, in Germany. And so the south of the Netherlands was part of that core region, but the north was more or less free from uh, feudal uh, influences or freed itself after being conquered by Charlemagne, uh, again from feudal inf uh, influences. So it was, uh, uh, it could profit in, in a way from, from both systems. Uh, uh, it profited from the early growth of the European economy, which was driven by feudal exploitation and uh, urbanization and uh, sur surplus extraction in the countryside in the classical way. And it also uh, profited from the free trade, which was carried out by the Frisians uh, uh, in the north and uh, northern part of the country. So this combination uh, we analyze is an important reason for the, the, the ultimate success of the Netherlands in this period. It, uh, uh, in a way, it uh, had the best of both world, the, the feudal world and the, yeah, the free world of the Frisians. And so after a few uh, centuries, um, you would argue that uh, the Netherlands was eventually, or what eventually we're going to know as the Netherlands, was the pioneer of, um, of capitalism, right? What, what do you mean by that? What does this new system that you call capitalism and and how was this like happening on on the ground like how do we see that happening in in, in the netherlands shall i start um i i think we do not claim that the netherlands was the pioneer of capitalism we uh, claim that it was one of the pioneers of capitalism and we we do not go into the debate whether Italy was uh, uh, the first or other parts of the world were first, China, for example. But we do make the claim that it was uh, a pioneer of capitalism. And uh, uh, the main features of the transition towards a capitalist economy are the rise of, of labor markets, capital markets, and markets for land, and of course, commodity markets. So there are all kinds of uh, indications that uh, market exchange was growing very rapidly in the 14th and the 15th century. And uh, at about 1500, we, we can clearly document, because there are very detailed sources about it, that. Uh, more, more than 40, 50 percent of the labor force is wage labor, for example. That is a very vital and uh, 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 capital market with low interest rates, four, five, six percent, and is 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 normal at the time. 
and that uh, land was transferred uh, quite easily between uh, Dutch inhabitants. So that, that's, uh, in our view, are the main features of the of a capitalist economy. But maybe to add to that, so one of the reasons why in these parts uh, these m markets emerged was the commercialization of the countryside. And so, of course, in these uh, early European economies, the large majority of uh, the workers are, are living and working uh, in the countryside and not in urban economies. So uh, this is one element in the bigger debate about the origins of capitalism. Was it, as Wallerstein claimed, a product of international trade? Was it, uh, as Brenner claimed, uh, a product of uh, changes in the countryside? Uh, or as uh, Marx claimed, a product really of uh, uh, the industrial economy. But one of the things that happened was that in the western part of the country, that big swamp that was drained uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, there are ecological problems which have to do with rising water levels and um, uh, soils which are um, uh, becoming too wet as a result. Um, and this created a transition from a, let's say, small-scale farming system uh, where uh, farmers were primarily growing f to feed their own families to one uh, in which um, animal husbandry is uh, 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 the main source of income. And that, of course, operates through markets. So you get uh, 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 an agricultural economy that is very market oriented. And as a result, on top of that, a lot of labor from the countryside is liberated, or you could say kicked out and moves to the uh, town. So you see commercial agriculture arising. And at the same time, uh, the uh, urban sector is growing uh, very rapidly. And again, of course, that is a market-driven uh, 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 type of economy in, in urban environments. So, so um, it's a combination of institutional and ecological factors that is uh, driving the process. I mean, with this response, you're emphasizing the importance of the emergence of markets, um, but also you talk in the book about this sort of character that are what you call the civil society, right? Yeah. Um, what was the role of that? Like, what, what do you mean when you talk about the civil society? What was the role of this uh, creature or entity in, in, in this yeah. process? Yeah. So the idea is that in already in this period, uh, ordinary people um, do have much more um, agency uh, politically, socially, economically than your average history textbook allows them. Eh? They are emphasizing how the nobility uh, is um, uh, yeah, uh, holding firm on, on what happens in society. But what we emphasize is that both in the countryside, in villages, and in towns, ordinary people uh, are organizing themselves and are also um, controlling uh, major institutions because there is so little central authority. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why we uh, have a relatively positive uh, evaluation of the feudal system, we say it created uh, an institutional environment in which guilds, but also um, uh, in the countryside, you have all these agencies that uh, uh, look after water management. Uh, that's a big issue in, in the western parts of the Netherlands. Um, you have um, uh, poor relief agencies, you have uh, civic militias, all these institutions bring together ordinary citizens uh, and they uh, give them a platform to negotiate with the authorities. And as a result of that, there is a very strong tradition of local governance 
which not only affects the political domain, but we claim also has a very positive role in the economic domain. It creates, let's say, structure where the authorities do not offer uh, a public order. It um, incentivizes people to um, take economic risks, for example, because they know that the fruits of their labor will not be confiscated by the authorities. They uh, are protected by these local institutions. So this is a very important part of our story indeed. And, and also in other respects, the, the society in which capitalism emerges in the late Middle Ages is uh, uh, special in a way. There is uh, a relatively uh, equal balance between men and women. So gender relations are, are not really equal, but relatively, un, uh, uh, relatively uh, the, the level of inequality is relatively low. And there is also no slavery, no uh, forced labor. Slavery has disappeared. So in 1500, you find here a, a, a very complex society without slavery, which is also quite rare in world history. Is this the result of, um, or how important, I guess, probably is the right way of, uh, of asking this, uh, of the... Um, demographic and, and geographic conditions, the fact that you have a densely a not very densely populated area and probably labor was not um, abundant enough. So things like the formation of a, a strong slave system was not very feasible. Was that important in that story? Um, I don't think we give a, a, a completely satisfactory explanation why slavery disappeared from Western Europe. I think that's still a bit of a mystery. Uh, part of the story is that the, the Catholic Church did not allow Christians to enslave other Christians. And if you are then living in the Netherlands within a, a sea of other regions which are all Christian, then it's very difficult to find a source of slavery, uh, of slaves. So that's part of the story. Uh, uh, also, the, uh, the, the disappearance of the coerced labor and the feudalism uh, uh, is a very gentle and very uh, uh, fast process. So the forced labor simply uh, disappears. And uh, the, the main po political bodies, in a way, of this new society are the, the cities, the, co the communes, and they also have a, a kind of ideology of, uh, of freedom, of defending their uh, 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 rights uh, against, for example, the, the, the king. And that also strengthens those tendency towards uh, uh, increased freedom, I think. Let me, let me ask you something about that. Um... And, and I mean the, the role of the king, the crown, and in this context, right? Because eventually this um, um, empowered civil society that you describe is uh, controlled by the Spanish crown, right? And, and what I thought is like the, the role of um, the Spanish crown has been so important in the history of Latin America. And we're we're quite concerned about the long-term legacies of, of this and, and economic performance. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Of, of course, like the duration of the exposure to this control and the practices were different. But um, I would like to hear from you about those um, impacts that uh, resulted from, uh, from the influence of the Spanish crown in, in the Netherlands. What... Uh, did it matter at all that uh, they were there at some point? Uh, absolutely, it did matter. But of course, you can't compare it to uh, the situation in Latin America for the simple reason that the Netherlands were not a colony of the Spanish crown. And the, the, Spa the, the Habsburg um, emperor, Charles V, became ruler of the Low Countries in a 
in a legitimate way. He was not initially seen as somebody, he was even born in the Low Countries, in Ghent. And so he uh, is not considered to be a foreigner. He is not somebody who um, uh, tries to colonize uh, society. But what he did do, uh, he made an attempt to centralize authority because Charles was not ruler of the Netherlands. He was ruler of all the small entities that make up the Low Countries, almost 20 of them. So he was the, the Duke of uh, Brabant, the Count of Holland, the Duke of Gelders, and so on and so forth. And so he collected a huge number of titles in his hand. Uh, the problem that he faces, well, there are two problems that he has. One is that he is fighting wars all over Europe. They are very expensive. So he tries to extract additional revenue. And the second problem he's facing is that more or less uh, in, at the same time that he uh, accedes to the throne, the Reformation is launched by Martin Luther in Germany, which creates an incredible amount of political anxiety in Europe because there is a general assumption that uh, any polity where the, the, the citizens or the subjects, if you will, are divided on this fundamental issue of religion is bound to collapse. So Charles and also his colleagues in other countries make huge efforts to re-establish religious homogeneity. For both policies, so extracting additional revenue and imposing religious homogeneity, he has to ride roughshod over all these local and uh, regional uh, privileges, uh, rules, traditions, and so on. So he creates new institutions in Brussels they try to impose a sort of uniform governance throughout the whole region. And this then um, um, creates a, lot, a very firm opposition, which ultimately leads to the so-called Dutch revolt. Um, and you have similar revolts in Spain and, you know, everywhere in Europe. But not quite uniquely, but quite, uh, well, to some extent uniquely, in the Netherlands, this leads to the establishment of a new country. Yeah, but it's, so, yes, there are similarities with what happens in Latin America, but at the same time, it is a very different context because these um, rebels in the low countries, they say, we have a contract with you. Charles and later his son Philip, we are in a contractual relation. You promised to maintain our liberties and you're not doing that. So you can no longer be our legitimate ruler. And that's where the struggle begins. Yeah. The, in a way, the Spanish reign from the perspective of the Dutch started uh, only with Philip the, the second taking over the, the role of Charles uh, V, that's 55, I think. And then it, it uh, takes 15 years or so before the Dutch start to revolt against this Spanish ruler. So they understood very quickly, within uh, 15 years or so, that this was not the kind of regime that they uh, could live with. And so that explains the, 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 the Dutch revolt, which uh, created this new country that M Martin mentioned. Let me um, um, use that um, event to ask you about the regional heterogeneity in, in, in your story, right? Because frequently when people think about the Netherlands, they imagine this somewhat small uh, homogeneous place. But one of the things that you describe very well in the in the book is how there has been a quite different set of paths in different periods for uh, the uh, economic performance of these regions. What's the big story there? Like what regions 
that economic activity at what points, um, uh, which others um, lag behind. Uh, what what could you uh, tell us about that? Um, well, in the in the Middle Ages, there is clearly the uh, the, the North is, is is free, but it's not, it's not developing very quickly, and the South is uh, becoming part of the Flemish Brabant Tyne economy, and is urbanizing uh, 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 relatively rapidly. So. The center of the, the Low Countries is uh, 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 until about 1300, uh, 1350 in the south. And then you see the emergence of Holland, which is changing everything dramatically because between the, third, the Black Death and 1500, the Holland becomes the new powerhouse of the, the Dutch economy. And from that point onwards until the present, uh, even today, there is this contrast between the Randstad, the uh, urban region in the west in Holland, and the less urbanized parts of the country in the north, the east, and the south. So the, the, there is, has been a, a fundamental reorientation of the spatial structure of the Dutch economy in about uh, uh, the 15th century, I would say. Now let me bring into the uh, the picture the the colonial era of uh, of the Dutch Republic or, or the Netherlands again to keep like uh, the terms that we're using. Um, what was the role of uh, of colonialism and now back again slavery, but like played in, in in a different context, right? So eventually the Netherlands expands and the world is one of the leaders of the European. Um, um, colonization of, of what today we would call the Global South. Um, how important was that in this big story of um, capitalism um, emerging early on in, in, in the Netherlands? Well, clearly it is very important, but it's also um, we have to in the book we distinguish a number of aspects. Um, and let me explain that. So uh, what happens in, well, the decades around 1600 is that um, not only the Netherlands, but also uh, uh, the English are um, shifting their uh, interests onto the world stage. Hey? Of course, so the European powers that have initially uh, explored um, uh, commerce with the non-European parts of the globe have been Portugal and Spain. They've also more or less officially carved up the world between them. And the Pope has given them a document that has legitimized that. But then around 1600 in the 1590s, the English and the Dutch are also uh, interested in getting a slice of that pie. And for the Dutch in particular, this is partly uh, induced by economic concerns, but also partly because they see it as an opportunity to hit back economically, but also militarily at the Spanish Habsburgs. And we have to keep in mind that since 1580, Portugal and Spain are merged into a single polity. So this, from the very start, is a combination of warfare and profit, money-making. In the beginning, most of these efforts are directed at Asia. And uh, the Dutch hold back in the Atlantic, more or less, for political reasons. After 1621, they also start to get involved in the uh, business of Atlantic colonialism. But their initial attempts to uh, set up a plantation economy of their own in Brazil are defeated by the Portuguese uh, who have already settled there and by uh, strong attempts by the Spanish crown to kick them out again. And that's what... Uh, ultimately happens. 
So the Atlantic efforts are not very profitable in the beginning. It's really only in the late 17th century that a new attempt is made, this time more successful, in Suriname to set up a plantation economy. Suriname is uh, traded with the uh, English against New York, uh, which was known at the time as New Netherland, uh, and um, well, was a, a colony in jeopardy. So the Dutch get hold of Suriname and they create a, uh, uh, a slave-based plantation economy on the South American mainland. Already long before that, they were involved in the trade in humans, partly to supply uh, those plantations in Brazil, but also partly to supply plantations run by the Spaniards in other territories in Latin America. In the Asia, there are also places where slave labor is employed, but most of that is not, let's say, in productive activities. There is some, and uh, we shouldn't overlook the importance of slavery, but it would be wrong to claim, um, at least that's the point we make in the book, that the so-called Dutch Golden Age is the product of slave labor. Yes, it contributed to uh, the growth of that economy, but yeah, it, it became much more important at a later point. Let's talk about... Uh, about probably the end of the period that you are uh, studying the book. And this probably connects with some of the research that you've done um, in other papers and, and books. And it's about um, the end of that golden uh, era, right? So eventually what happens is that um, the UK uh, becomes the lead of the global economy and the Netherlands in a way or another lags behind. Um, what's this story there? Is it uh, an absolute decline? Is it a relative decline? Or, um, and if that's the case, what what's happening there, right? Is this story about innovation? It seems that, so the takeoff of the UK is frequently associated with uh, the technology of, uh, of industrial production and was there something that in the Netherlands constrained that type of innovation? I want to hear about that. And maybe Jean Luten, you can start with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to begin with, um, this is a normal part of the development of capitalism that the centers, the core regions of capitalism change over time. And so the, the golden age was preceded by the age of Antwerp, the 16th century. Before that, uh, Flanders, Ghent, Bruges were the center of the world uh, for, of the Northwestern Europe. So you see a movement of changes of the spatial structure of economies uh, and uh, the move from uh, uh, Amsterdam to London is uh, obviously the next step. But then within England, you see uh, another move from London to the uh, north, where the, uh, which is the real region where the Industrial Revolution occurs. So this is, uh, uh, as such, it's a normal process. What we see happening in the 18th century is that there is still some economic growth, but uh, less fast and less extensive in the sense that it draws in a lot of new laborers from outside the region uh, than in the 17th century. But there is no absolute decline. In the, in the older literature, it was uh, said that it was a period of absolute decline, but we find uh, uh, very uh, continuous, uh, continuous uh, economic growth in this period until the French period when Wars and occupation really changed the picture dramatically. One of the, uh, uh, this is clearly related to, the, to technology. The, the, the Dutch economy was based on peat as a source of energy, it was based on wind power, but it did not use a lot of coal. 
for uh, 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 industrial pro processes. So it did not have the same tradition of applying coal to uh, industry. Uh, 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 and uh, its main uh, engineers were working with timber. They were making big variations of windmills. But uh, there was not an indigenous uh, uh, iron industry which uh, produced more sophisticated uh, iron machines. So uh, it, it uh, missed certain links to new uh, innovative developments which were happening in France and in, uh, in England. And therefore it uh, developed relatively late in the, uh, in the 19th century its uh, modern industrial basis. Let me ask you one one final question, and I want to get back to uh, where we uh, started our conversation um, regarding how you perceive the field and and um, your general impression of how your career uh, was. And now I'm thinking, how do you think the future of the field is gonna look like? So do you think that you're basically giving this like um massive piece of work that says well this was the history of the economic history of the netherlands and this whole period what aspects of that history do you think that deserve more attention in the future where do you think that the research is gonna focus on what is, what is the most promising areas um, are you optimistic at all do you think that with you out of food track, this field is going to die. I want to hear about that. <laughs> Will you start, Martin, or shall I? No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I'm always optimistic, and I think uh, perhaps not in Utrecht, we, we, we don't know, but the, the field will continue to develop. I think there are major challenges, for example, in the field of environmental concerns, biodiversity, change. Uh, sustainability issues uh, that should be incorporated in the stories that we are telling as economic historians. So even, even broadening the, the subject matter uh, uh, more dramatically is one of the challenges of the future. Uh, <coughs> I have already tried a, a bit to work, for example, on the history of biodiversity And I think it's a, a very fascinating topic that deserves much more attention. So I think the, the, the process that has started uh, with the uh, new economic history in the 60s and the 70s uh, uh, of quantification and of broadening the subject that, uh, that is being studied, that will, that will continue and, and it will make economic history even more fascinating than it is already. So I, I am really optimistic about that. Uh, Are you also optimistic, to... Martin, about so, no, like, I'm well, going to ask you also about social history because... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, there are two things that as a social historian, I'm a little bit concerned about. So one is that um, the social historians, as I already indicated in the beginning, uh, so in the 1970s, when I was a student, there was a strong interest among social historians in fields like sociology and anthropology. So uh, a stronger collaboration with the social sciences. And I feel that um, we have lost that uh, as a result of the so-called cultural turn. And even though the cultural turn is no longer uh, quite as strong as it was in, let's say, the 1990s, we haven't regained that connection. And another worrisome trend, in my view, is uh, the, um, the drift, let me phrase it that way, among economic historians to become uh, very model-driven. So in the Netherlands, economic historians work in history departments. But in the UK, and uh, uh, particularly in the United States, economic historians work in economics departments, and there they are subject, at least that's how I understand it, to particular pressures, which you see reflected in the way um, 
yeah, quantification is applied to the past. Uh, and some of that quantification is driven in turn by the demands of uh, econ journals. Uh, and it creates, it widens the rift between economic and social history. And as I explained, so Jan Uyte and myself, we have tried to uh, stay in touch uh, intellectually over the 30 years that we collaborated. Uh, and um, I have always very much appreciated the quantitative work that Jan Luyten did, but he was always open to the sort of conversations that you see in the book. And uh, yeah, it worries me a little bit that the opportunities for that might, I'm not saying will, but might diminish in the future. And this is partly um, because the social historians don't engage in the conversation, but it's also because some uh, economic historians feel more or less compelled to withdraw from the conversation for the reasons I explained. So this is a concern that I have. I'm glad that you bring that up because it's probably... Um... <clears throat> Um, a good way of uh, of celebrating what you've done in the book, which is uh, a very nice synergy of economic and social history. Um, it's also, I, I need to say, like a, um, a beautiful thing that it's also sort of celebration of like your joint career. And, and, and I thought it was very nice. So thanks a lot for writing the book. Thanks a lot for being here. Um, I hope to, to see you soon. Well, I'll be giving a paper in Berkeley uh, about the book next month. So maybe we run into each other. Uh, certainly, certainly. You never know. You must. Okay, thanks, thanks for everybody. hosting us. Yeah, uh, Javier. yeah for, for the nice conversation. It, uh, it all also always helps also us to explain again what the book is about, to realize what the book is about. So thanks a lot for, for that. Thank you. Thank you.